Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Belize Zoo, known as the best little zoo in the world. So this evening, we'll be taking you on a very special tour of the Belize Zoo, where you'll be meeting some very spooky and oftentimes very scary inhabitants of the Belizean jungles. This time of year, most of our visitors are looking forward to Boo at the Zoo. It's become a, a yearly event that we have established to bring families closer to not, not only the animals that live at the zoo, but again, these ones that are more specifically, oftentimes fear or, or myth inspiring. And because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been unable to do so last year and this year. So instead, we've partnered with Colorblind to bring Boo at the Zoo to you in your homes this Halloween. Join us as we go along meeting some of the more charismatic creatures of the night and evening, as well as meeting some of their caregivers while we explore why these animals are often so scary in our minds, but more importantly, the important role that they serve in our culture and our ecology here in Belize. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Peck, uh, and I'm a zookeeper here for the past six years now. So today we'll be seeing a tropical rat snake. Uh, it's been locally known as rat snake or thunder lightning snake. That's what they call them, right? So these snakes, they grow approximately eight feet in length, full grown. So this one here is about four and a half feet. And so it still has to grow. And they will love to eat rats. That's what they eat. And these snakes here now, they, they, some snakes do not lay eggs, but these ones, they lay egg. So these snakes here, they move very fast, as you can see how it's moving in my hand. If I let it go, it will go all over right now. Again, these are uh, one of the non-venomous snakes, so there is probably over 58 snakes species of snakes found in Belize, and these are one of the 54 non-venomous snakes, right? So over here we have a boa constrictor. Uh, his name is Balboa. So anytime you come to the zoo, you ask for a Balboa, you'll meet Balboa here. So Balboa is a boa constrictor. So boa constrictors are one of the 54 non-venomous snakes again. So these are one of our largest snakes that you can find in Belize, which grow approximately 12, 13 feet in length. The difference between boa constrictor and the other non-venomous snakes, some of them lay eggs, and which in these they give life birth to 50 young snakes at one litter. You might hear people saying that these snakes are called the mother of all snakes, which these do not give birth to any type of snakes, just boa constrictor. Where you mostly find these snakes are probably in people's backyard uh, where it's swampy. Why? Because they, that, that's where rodents might stay. And then these ones, they control the rodent population, which are the rats and the mice, okay? So they have a, a good importance to be around. So anytime you see a boa constrictor, don't be afraid. Just leave the boa constrictor alone. It's helping the rodent's population. So these boa constrictor, the way they kill their prey is by her explaining to us. So these boa constrictor, they would wrap around their, 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 their food until the prey's breath is completely gone. So it, anytime it wraps around it, it just tighten, tighten. And once the, the breath is out from the, the, the food, then that's where they start to consume their food. And these boa constrictor can open their mouth very big. So they have a teeth that's, I would say, a hook like this inside, which helps them to consume their prey. All right? So you feeling anything yet? No. Okay. The difference between a boa constrictor and a furlans is it's very hard to, to identify them if you don't know your snake, right? So the pattern here you're seeing can tell you it's, it's, it's a boa constrictor comparing to the pattern here on the picture here. The next thing, it's the formation of the head. So the furlans normally have a, a V shape and these ones they have like a U shape. And you can see their eye as well and the coloration under the, the, the head, All right? So these ones, they, they, they won't 
they won't be aggressive as the further lands as well. So that's you, another way how you can tell that these, uh, the, the snake is not a boa constrictor than, um, or a further lands because further lands they would stay and fight. These ones they would stay and immediately leave the scene, right? The further lands they have fangs, which means that's what they use to, two fangs which, that, which they use to inject the venom that's right above their head. So these ones, again, they have a, like a, a inside you that would help them to consume their prey. So that's how you know the difference between these boa, um, boa constrictor and fur lands. So I'm here with my fellow tapir, Indy. Um, Indy is one of the more well-known tapirs at the zoo because first and foremost, he's right at the beginning of Tapir Town, but also he's always very eager to come over and meet guests once you have a peace offering kindly provided by one of our uh, zookeepers or one of our educators that typically lead tours at the zoo. But more importantly, so Indy is a represent representation of our national animal, the Central American Tapir. And tapirs have been one of the animals that the zoo has focused the longest on its, um, its awareness, building awareness around the species, education, and also about dispelling myths. When Sharon Matola, the founder of the Belize Zoo, first came to Belize and started interacting with people and showing them the, the animals of their country, one of the most prevailing stories that she would get about tapirs was that tapirs were vicious monsters that would bust through the trees and skin you alive with their snout. And this, this really had an impact on people that would see them, even just in a zoo setting. They were extremely fearful of this animal. It was one of the animals people were most fearful of seeing in the wild. The reality is that, as you can see, we're feeding in the uh, greenery, no skin or anything meat related. So they are actually one of the, the largest herbivores we have in our landscape. And they, eat, they consume a tremendous amount of leaf matter, vegetation, fruits, vegetables. So they have no interest in eating meat. And their snout, uh, the scary um, uh, mythical snout that they have, is actually called, it's called a prehensile snout or nose. You can also call it a trunk if you'd like. And it's used for grasping and pulling down low hanging fruit and vegetation and getting it directly into their mouth. So it's a very functional tool, almost like a hand on their face, with no interest in using to skin anyone alive. They didn't, there is some risk in approaching a wild tapir, so even though they aren't meat eaters and they are usually very gentle, calm animals, it's not recommended to approach a wild tapir. They are very much capable of defending themselves. They have very thick, compact, powerful bodies. And their teeth, even though they're made for, for grinding down vegetation, can deliver a bite to something that they perceive as a threat. So even the most hardy, uh, accomplished jaguar often thinks twice about taking on a full-grown tapir to the point where people have seen tapirs in the wild with claw marks on their bodies just continuing on their morning stroll showing that they got into a fight with a jaguar and won or at least escaped to live another day. So again, our national animal, a very vital part of forest ecology. They're nature's gardeners, they help with spreading seeds and germination. And once left alone and given space, they pose no direct threat to humans uh, or otherwise. Come on, bud. There we go. Set up your can't climb. Oops. Thank you, Indy. Okay, guys, so over here we have Archie the Ant Eater. Uh, Ara hormiga mexicana tamandúa, in Spanish oso hormiguero. As you can see, he's a very active little guy. He's only one year old. Um, he came to us very young, approximately one or two weeks old. He still had his umbilical cord on. Archie here, what his diet is a lot of termites and ants. Um, what they do in the wild, they find termites and they break it open and use your tongues and eat the young ones. They don't eat any, any type of termites, they just eat the baby ones. Um, they can flicker their tongue 200 times per minute, meaning they can pick up thousands and thousands of termites um, during 
you're eating. In captivity, we change your diet to fruits. Um, Archie is here, he's still eating milk. And their tongue, they can extend their tongue up to six inches long. So as you can see, he is very used to people. Um, the beliefs of anteaters here in Belize is that if they come across your dog, they can kill it and they would stick their tongue inside their, their ear and eat their brains, but that's not true. These guys, all they eat is termites and ants and fruits. <laughs> Over here we have Lindo behind us. Uh, he's one of our problem jaguar that was brought from the wild to the zoo and is given a second chance of life. And this jaguar here is one of our ambassador of the species because these jaguars in the wild, whenever they're out in the wild, they go after domestic animals. Reason being is because some of them are injured Probably people had shooting them out there but didn't kill them and some of them have a, a natural injury which are dental issue or probably they are blind in the eye so that's the reason why people might have problem seeing them hunting their livestock. But these cats here they are one of the top predator which can probably weigh between 120 to 140 pounds in males and again the patterns on the coat are called the rosettes they're all different they're like our human fingerprints right different so this jaguar here we managed to train him as you can see if he does a roll over roll buddy roll come on come on buddy roll come on roll buddy Right. Catch. So jaguars again, they have the strongest bite, which is approximately over a thousand pounds per square inch. Whenever they kill their prey, it's one bite directly to the skull. That's it. Right. So people might believe that these jaguars might hunt them in the wild, uh, which is uh, not true because these jaguars. They hunt for white tail there, agoutis, the gibnut, the armadillos, sometimes a crocodile or probably turtles. And these jaguars here, because they are nocturnal animals, so they hunt at night. So their patterns make them very camouflage out there in the wild during the day. So you could be passing by a jaguar if you're out there in the jungle and the jaguar won't bother you, right? Okay guys, so over here we have Nelson the Morlets crocodile. Here in Belize we have two species of crocodiles. We have the American crocodile, which is a, more of a saltwater crocodile, so you can find this more to the coast and Nelson over here the Mordet crocodile is a freshwater crocodile. The freshwater crocodile and the American crocodile difference is in, in size. Um, the Mordet crocodile is three, 3 meters long, 8, eight to 9 feet long and the American crocodile could grow from 11 to 12 feet in length. The Mordet crocodile love to eat apple snails and the American crocodile love to eat fish. Uh, their importance in the ecosystem is to keep the fish population down so there is no overgrown population of a certain type of fish. Uh, here in Belize we have a problem with uh, crocodiles and, and humans is that whenever humans see a crocodile they say oh cool let's feed the crocodile. They start feeding the crocodile then they start a conflict between humans and the crocodile which meaning if you start to feed them at uh, the moment that you don't have food for them they will attack you attack you believing that you will be food. Here in Belize we do not have the man-eating crocodiles. If we leave the, these crocodiles alone, they won't be a threat to us. Um, 
These guys are quite prehistoric. They come all the way from the dinosaur era and slowly evolve to what they look now. Uh, they can survive up to 100 years and in captivity, they can actually surpass that. And since they are reptiles, it takes a long process for them to digest their food. So if they eat like today, they won't be eating maybe a week time or a month time, depending on how large the meal was. And just like how we humans have emotions, crocodiles also have emotions and animals in general have emotions. Crocodiles, they are excellent thinkers. They're, they can feel and they can um, shed crocodile tears also whenever they're feeling pain. So here we are with Panama the Harpy Eagle, who is no stranger to most zoo fans and followers. Uh, Panama is one of the iconic animals at the zoo that has had a birthday party over the years. Now this species is not necessarily scary or spooky to a lot of our, our visitors, a lot of our followers, but this is a species that definitely has a level of fear and misunderstanding attached to it. The Harpy Eagle is the largest of the eagles in the Americas and one of the largest in the world. Harpies can weigh up to 20 pounds, as is the case of our female harpy eagle, the queen. The males, like Panama here, tends to weigh a little less, around 13 or 14 pounds. But regardless of that size difference, even the males are very powerful, very large bodied um, birds of prey. They have a six and a half foot wingspan and their talons, which is where all their power lies, is co often compared to the, the size of grizzly bear claws. It's five inches of talon for each one, each one of their uh, toes. And so they use this force to hunt large animals like themselves up in the canopies of our forest. So they are, have been known to hunt um, iguanas, they've been known to hunt coatimundi, anteaters, uh, kinkajus, and even the gray fox in Belize because these animals do climb trees. And the coraso and the crested guan, some of the, um, the jungle fowl that we are familiar with. So despite this really strong affinity to being up in the canopy, there is a misbelief, a misconception that harpies will swoop down on the ground and fly off with dogs, cats, and even children. So over the years, this mythology has been built around this animal to the point where in the past, when people would encounter them in the forest, in their own homes, they would be shot on sight because of that fear and that belief that, oh, I can't leave this thing to be because it'll probably fly off with my kid. So over the years, the, the harpy eagle has declined in population. It is a, a threatened species, much like the jaguar. So the zoo and Panama here, along with the queen, the ambassadors for their species, serve to educate people as to their species, why they are an important part of the forest. And even the exhibit that we're at, so we are actually at eye level with Panama, and that is intentional. We built this canopy, this sky walkway, so that people visiting the zoo would be at the level of a harpy eagle, where they would be in the, in the wild, up in the trees to reinforce that concept that this is where they spend the majority of their time. They don't soar over the, the canopy, they stick to the treetops inside it, and they almost never come on the ground. It is a very rare occurrence for a harpy to come on the ground looking for prey, and usually it's because of a severe shortage of prey in the, uh, in the forest canopy and branches. So again, Panama here, a very charismatic, very engaging ambassador for his species, reminding people that they prefer it up in the trees and on the ground, and that they do have an important role in keeping population balance in our forest ecosystem. So, so far on our nocturnal tour of the zoo, or our evening tour of the zoo, you've met some of the animals that are just on the verge of becoming nocturnal, some that are mostly known as crepuscular species, that are most active at dawn and dusk. However, as night starts to set in, we have some animals that are exclusively nocturnal, such as the barn owls behind me that you just heard do their signature screech. These owls are one of the most common throughout Belize. They are found not only in forested areas, but also in communities, both rural and urban. And so they are well known to many citizens in our cities such as Bamopan and Belize City, and further out in the towns and villages as well. And that is largely because they, they feast almost exclusively on rodents, on rats specifically, and they are one of the species that do this the best. Pound for pound, barn owls eat more rats than any other species in the world. A breeding group or a, a breeding pair that has just had fledglings, for example, can eat over a thousand in a single year. They are well built for this. They have a very exceptional hearing that can pick up the heartbeat of a mouse when it is several feet under the ground, both in the snow in, in regions and countries where they're found and also under the earth and soil, for example, here in Belize. They are also well known for other, for other parts of their mythology, however. 
in that a lot of people, not only in Belize, but in other cultures, believe that the screech of the barn owl is a herald that someone in your household is going to pass. The reality is that not all owls hoot. Like we know, uh, thanks to Hollywood movies and cartoons, some owls produce different vocalizations, and we hope to showcase a few of those for you tonight. The barn owl, though, is the, one of the few owls that can actually genu genuinely produce a screech rather than a hoot. And so when this is issued out, it's a form of communication between members of a flock, and it is to indicate that they are actually actively hunting rodents in the community that they're in. So again, they are a very useful component to have especially in areas that have issues with garbage control or garbage disposal, which tends to breed pests like rodents. So having these natural predators and balancers of pest populations, such as boa constrictors and barn owls, are a cheap or a cost-effective way to keep the health detriments that these animals can bring to urban communities to a minimum. Now to wrap up our tour of the zoo this evening, we are ending with one of the more colorful and vocal species of all that we have in Belize, the spectacle owl, who you can hear vocalizing <laughs> behind me. As I mentioned with our barn owls, each owl can have its own unique vocalization. They don't all necessarily hoot in that common hoot that we've come to know. Hoodwink, as he, as he demonstrates, has a very uh, much more almost haunting um, bubbly vocalization and again this is something that they use to communicate with members of their species or to communicate that they are seeing something that has alerted their attention. Spectacle owls unlike barn owls are more forest dwelling so you won't see them showing up in any of our cities or our towns. They like broadleaf forests or rainforest and they are well equipped for hunting in these areas. They have exceptional hearing but also very good eyesight and their feathers, much like all owls, are serrated and very soft so it gives them the ability of fly flying silently through the areas that they're hunting. So much so that the prey that they're seeking out, such as rodents, opossums, frogs, lizards, and little snakes, never hear these predators coming towards them. They're also well known for their very kind of alert and, and spooky, look, spooky look that they do when they're latched onto something, and the unusual effect that, they, that happens when they don't move their eyes. So owls actually have their eyes fixed in their sockets, and they're unable to move them like human beings can. And so they have to move their entire head when they're trying to adjust for depth perception or to lock in on the movement of a prey species that they see on the forest floor. They're also another infamous um, ability that owls have is the ability to turn their head almost all the way around. So they don't do a full 360, it's more like a 270. And the simple explanation for this is that they have literally twice the number of neck vertebrae that humans do. So where we have seven neck bones, owls have 14. And so this gives them that maneuverability in their head to again lock in on a species and follow it even as it goes beyond the typical lining of, of someone's uh, front, front facing view. So this really makes them capable of, of keeping track and tracing and hunting effectively. So when they do finally take that swoop towards a uh, prey item, it's a, very, it's a very useful investment of time and will likely result in success. <laughs> We've now come to the end of this very special edition of Bo at the Zoo, a virtual one in this scenario. But we hope it was just as entertaining and informative for all of you that chose to tune in as it is when you all come to us in person, which we hope we'll resume in the very near future. We'd like to thank Colorblind Multimedia Productions for partnering us with us on this wonderful event. And we hope that the animals, even if they remain spooky and scary to our viewers, that they are also special in some way, now that we've learned a little bit more about them and have a little bit more of an understanding as to their role and importance, not only in our ecology in Belize, but also our culture. They have a right to be here just as the rest of us do. They do have an important function in their own right. And it is our job to ensure that they always remain a part of our natural heritage. Thank you very much for tuning in. Happy Halloween to everybody.